We'll now commence uh, session two, uh, Environment, um, and I'll introduce our second moderator, Professor Andrew Howey. Professor Howey is a coral reef ecologist based at the ARC Centre of Excellence, Coral Reef Studies, James Cook University, where he leads a large team investigating the effects of climate change and local human stresses on the structure and functioning of coral reef ecosystems. Andrew has over 20 years of experience studying coral reefs, uh, both in Australia and overseas. He was a core member of the team documenting the recent coral bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef and Coral Sea. In 2011, he was awarded a Churchill Fellowship to investigate the effects of seaweed chemicals on the health of reef building corals, which helped to shape his current focus on understanding the importance of different species to the recovery and resilience of coral reef ecosystems. Please welcome Professor Howey. Thanks, Ken. Um, what a wonderful introduction. Um, welcome to everyone at the concession of the convention, and as Ken mentioned, focusing on the environment. Now, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which we're all meeting. For me here in Townsville, that is the Bindle and Wolgaruka Bar peoples, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to point out a special thank you to Ken, Jill, Kirsty, and the team, really for all of their efforts and resilience in preparing and planning the convention under what turned out to be very challenging conditions. I mean, even with the outbreak ongoing or in the situation, I don't think we could have anticipated what they've had to go through over the last couple of weeks. So a huge thank you there. So our next presenter is Rebecca Prince Ruiz. Uh, Rebecca is the founder of a global movement that helps millions of people be part of the solution to the plastic to plastic pollution. Becoming concerned with the amount of plastics going into landfill, she encouraged first her family to go plastic free for the month of July. Her idea is now a global initiative with an estimated 326 million people participating worldwide. What, what an absolutely incredible achievement. Uh, Rebecca is the executive director of the not-for-profit not Plastic Free Foundation that brings the public and business together with the vision of, of a world without plastic waste. In recognition of, of this work, Rebecca was awarded the 2021 Western Australian Local Hero Award as part of the Australian of the Year um, program. She was a 2015 uh, Churchill Fellow and now I'd like to pass over to Rebecca. Thank you. Pollution problem and how changing our own behaviour. Hello, my name is Rebecca prince Ruiz, and today I'd like to share with you the story of my journey over the last decade, working on the plastic waste and pollution problem and how changing our own behaviour is key to tackling some of the wicked challenges facing our environment. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Wajak Nyungabuja in Western Australia and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging for it's their continuing custodianship of this land on which I live that gives me hope that we too can start to turn around some of these issues. So the Plastic Free July Challenge that I work on started a decade ago. And it started with not a grand ideas for a big campaign, but really about making small changes. It started when I was working in local government and went to a local recycling facility where the waste from my yellow litter bin that I put out on the curb every fortnight went. I was really overwhelmed by two things. One is just seeing the sheer volume of waste. I knew what our waste looked like that we made in our home, but seeing my waste with my neighbours and everyone else in my suburbs and my street was pretty overwhelming. And secondly, just looking at the process and understanding the journey that my waste went on. After all, before I just put my waste in, I'd throw it away and never really thought about what away was or where it went. And what happened when you, it got to this facility 
is it's sorted into the different material types into paper, plastic, metal and glass, and then baled and shipped for reprocessing and recycling. And I used to always feel really good if I filled my recycling bin. I kind of thought I was saving the planet. Now, it's not that recycling isn't important, but what I realised when I went to this facility was that the best thing that I could do, the best choices that I make, was actually to limit what I produced. So that day I decided that I was going to try and make a difference in what I did in my home and our family. The next month just happened to be July, so I set myself a challenge of just trying to avoid not all plastic, but just the single-use plastics that were ending up in this facility and, and also, unfortunately, our environment. And so the next day, uh, about 40 of my colleagues and our volunteer network in local government decided we'd all give it a go. And from that day, back in June 2011, we've now grown what was, I call it accidentally, a global movement where millions of people take part. And I've got to admit, it was more of a challenge than I thought, changing my own behaviour. I thought I was pretty good. I always took my water bottle. I had my reusable shopping bags. But what it made me realise is plastic was everywhere. And it was actually more of a challenge than I thought. So this, this is photos of my three children. And 10 years ago, this was our first plastic free July. My son ended up carrying the shopping home um, because, yes, I had plus, uh, uh, reusable shopping bags, but I forgot them. And the challenge with plastic is it's cheap. It's often given out for free. Well, then it was the, the single-use uh, plastic shopping bags were given out for free. And even if you had the right intentions and had your own reusable bags, they were only reusable if you remembered to bring them with you. So it started to create some good habits of taking reusable bags, changing the way we shopped. We stopped shopping so much in the large supermarkets, supporting local greengrocers, going to the farmer's market, taking a Tupperware container if we went to buy cheese or olives or fish at local delis and fishmongers. Um, had to get reusable cups or beeswax wraps to get rid of glad wrap. Um, and had to also learn some new skills such as making garlic bread because it not only came wrapped in foil, but also plastic bag. And But one of the things that we learned that by doing it together, we were able to share ideas. So somebody would say, what do you do about pasta? And someone else would say, well, you can buy it from this store in a cardboard box or this store has it in bulk or here's a recipe. And we're also able to support each other with challenges because at that time, people weren't talking about the plastic waste or pollution problem. We hadn't had the war on waste or David Attenborough's Blue Planet um, so it was still pretty new. And by supporting each other, we could have conversations around um, what to do if you said no straw, please, and you end up getting two and changing the way we asked for things and uh, starting more conversations. And as we started to make changes in our own lives, create less waste, and often um, by stopping buying convenience food and fast food and lots of uh, processed packaged food we started to feel healthier and more connected to our community and so the following year we did it again and 400 people took part and 4,000 and and it grew from there really as a grassroots movement and as we had conversations um, people started to take it into their workplaces into their communities into their kids schools and it really grew um, virally and with no no um, strategy and no media spend and certainly no style guide. So I'm just going to share with you a bit more about the plastic waste issue and what we're talking about because I think for me learning about the problem and what we're tackling was really critical in figuring out the solutions and so I think it's always really important to start with that this is a relatively recent problem we've only invented plastic a little over a hundred years ago, originally to replace material like ivory and tortoise shell. But it wasn't until post-World War II when production really ramped up. And this is a, a cover from Life magazine back in the 1950s, where people had to be taught to, 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 to throw away items that had only been used once, such as these 
cups and utensils and plates because I don't think it is in our nature to be so wasteful. So production has increased and it's increasing. The estimates are that uh, plastic production will, in, will triple by, by 2050 at the rate that we're doing it. And the challenge is though most is technically recyclable. Our recycling systems just haven't caught, uh, kept up with that. So of all the plastics we've ever made, we've recycled 9% and of that 9%, only 10% more than once so it tends to be down cycled and that was part of the reason behind choosing plastic as the the subject matter at a time when it just was not on on people's radar and I, I, ha having a science background for me it was really important to understand the problem that we're tackling in order to develop solutions because I really wanted to to make a difference in in the work that we were doing so through the Churchill Fellowship, I had that opportunity to spend a couple of months looking at not just the research uh, on the issue, but also the range of solutions that it's going to take to start to turn around this wicked problem. So one of the things that, 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 it, that was part of this research of mine was that just uncovering that whilst a lot of the awareness has come from the ocean plastic pollution problem, that the majority, about three quarters of the plastic waste in the ocean comes from land. And that's where we need to start acting to make changes. I also, uh, through participating in marine debris research expeditions, really understood that we cannot clean up our way out of this problem. Unlike organic material, which breaks down and returns to the soil, plastic breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. And unfortunately, when that happens, that when it can be, that's when it can be ingested by our wildlife. This is a really difficult image to look at. It's a stomach contents of a flesh-footed shearwater trick from chick from the um, World Heritage listed Lord Howe Island. And you can see there these plastic fragments that were the contents of this chick's stomach other typical items that we use in our daily lives is bottle caps, probably a toothpaste cap, um, a couple of ties from, uh, balloon ties from helium balloons that were released. This chick had never left its nest and within its stomach is a whole range of our, the end result of this throwaway society. And whilst in Australia, we have relatively pristine oceans on a global scale. We've got great waste management systems, um, which of course need improving and, and education. We actually, because of our high levels of, of, of seabirds, the area in the world that seabirds are most at risk from plastic pollution is the Tasman Sea and the Southern Ocean boundary. So for me, it was really important to have this in perspective that this is a problem in our own backyard. And I think really believe it's something we can all be responsible for. What I also got through this research and my Churchill Fellowship was an understanding that we need to measure the issue and identify what the problematic items are in order to, um, in order to make, make changes. This was a, a water wheel in Baltimore, and it was collecting all of the, the trash that was floating on the surface. And it, um, as it takes it up that conveyor belt, it dumps it into a skip over the back. And you can see here a, a common array of particularly food and beverage containers. So understanding what these common items were, not only uh, encourages people to make changes in their own lives, but also um, is, a, is a foundation for getting the systemic change and, and, and policy change that's also critical. So whilst my motivation and our campaign is very driven by the problem and by the issues, what we did at the start just instinctively by sharing solutions and having conversations and doing it with our community has now formed a decade on 
the basis of our campaign because we now understand that this is also the basis of behaviour change best practice. So we know through our research that people are aware of the problem. No one's okay with this plastic waste ending up in landfill and ending up in our oceans. In fact, 90% of Australians say they're concerned about this. But there is a gap between people's choices and their behaviours. And so what we try and do with Plastic Free July is to reduce that gap. So you will see this is the homepage of our website. You can just Google it, Plastic Free July or PlasticFreeJuly.org. We're really focused on closing that value behaviour gap. So the language is really inclusive. It's encouraging and positive. It's join millions of people. Will you take part? so we can have cleaner streets, oceans, and beautiful communities. And our tagline isn't say no, our tagline is inclusive and positive. It's choose to refuse single use plastic. And so just like people said, they understand the problem. They also said they wanna know the solutions. So we share ideas and actions that people can take in their homes, in their kitchens, in their bathrooms, and also uh, into their communities and they also want to know what other people like them are doing so we also share stories of what people do to take Plastic Free July into their school what councils do in communities what people do in their families what corporates do um, and I think that's really important because what we don't need to do is uh, duplicate what's already happening out there. And I really believe we need to learn from others and we have to tackle these issues together. And we also grow each year to support communities in the particular challenges that they're facing. So this is some of our campaigns for this year. And obviously during COVID, there are many restrictions on people on the way that we shop and the way that we live. And we have um, continued to support people such as providing a safe um, guide to use of reusables, how to safely uh, wear cloth masks, et cetera, using World Health Organization guidelines. So these are some of the Plastic Free July participants. We have schools in India making reusable bags, uh, workplaces in London having plastic free lunches, physios making the switch to reusable um, glasses uh, for their clients and um, uh, switching to reusable coffee cups for their own for their own coffees there's uh, this is from a, the photo on the bottom right is a community in the Caribbean on St Kitts and St Nevis they have a plastic free July parade every year and lots of workshops and activities and it's their key month to tackle the plastic pollution issue. And they are really motivated to have a clean environment um, and which supports tourism for their economies. And some more stories and, and images, just to give you a flavor of how we inspire behavior change in our community of sharing what people are doing. And it's everything from changes in people's own lives to Jeannie and Amanda in the top left there who realised doing Plastic Free July, they were doing a lot of driving to buy their um, food weekly, do their weekly shopping without packaging and they ended up starting their own bulk food store. And our participants range from my neighbour, John, who um, started with his uh, switching to reusable shopping bags and then uh, also making a switch to reusable produce bags when he was buying fruit and veggies to the artist and musician Jack Johnson, who for Plastic Free July worked with the music industry, uh, gave his custom, uh, a concert goers reusable pint cups and then worked with the venues that he was touring to uh, put in water filters and accept reusable cups. and. Uh, around the world, we see inspiring stories like this and people translating all of our resources and materials into other language. So we're not out there doing the work on the ground, but through sharing ideas and stories. And that, that's the way that this ripple effect of, of 
of change grows. And just some more uh, examples of, of, of the ways that people take part. So we have lots of schools taking part. They, they love waste-free Wednesdays or nude food days to uh, encourage the kids. And there's often competitions between classrooms to have plastic-free lunches. So a lot, oftentimes they'll have a beeswax wraps making workshop so the kids can bring their sandwiches in those. We're seeing local governments make the switch uh, engaging their communities and providing infrastructure such as um, uh, water bottle refill stations. We see small businesses making changes in their packaging away from single use plastics and they'll put putting up their um, some of our posters and resources or adapting them to their own and as I said a real rise in the um, available not, not just bulk food stores but also supermarkets increasingly um, offering uh, unpackaged items and, and bulk food sections as well, which has been a really heartening change over the last decade. And as people start to change their own behaviours and look for alternatives, it does put pressure on, on businesses as they ask for that. And this is just a couple of examples that of... Um, of uh, different products that, that certainly weren't on the market 10 years ago. So wooden highlighter pencils to replace um, uh, plastic, plastic highlighters and they don't dry out and they're a really great tip. That's one of my favorites. And this year we saw quite a few bakeries, uh, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, switching from the plastic bread tags that we often find as uh, littered items in our cleanups to cardboard bread tags, which can be recycled. And it's been really uh, uh, um, exciting over the last couple of years in particular to see a rise of corporates taking part. So this was a food court in Brookfield uh, place this year that uh, have made great efforts to get rid of their single use plastic straws and utensils, etc. in their in their food courts. We've seen I spent some time this year in the Pilbara and saw a number of mining companies who um, were doing plastic free July and looking at ways to get rid of single use plastics in their food halls through their caterings and across their supply chains. And when you see that happen, that um, you, you really get changes in scale and putting pressure on, on producers and manufacturers to change. The thing about Plastic Free July is there's something for everyone. This is a material we all tackle in our daily lives. And I really think that we can all be part of the solution. In June this year, I was really delighted to go to a Plastic Free Morning Tea at Government House in Canberra um, with their excellencies, Mr. and Mrs. Linda Hurley, uh, the Governor General and his wife, and they hosted a number of local school primary schools that were participating. They sorted their waste into seven different bins and they're really committed to being part of the solution. And sometimes there's um, the solutions are just as simple as cafes offering a basket of donated mugs to um, the image on the right is, uh, I saw at a cafe the other day, I'd given a, a Plastic Free July talk to the staff of Rottnest Island Authority and the, they were in the um, cafe, they'd made a switch to uh, reusable cups for their board meetings. So our, our um, theory of change is that by empowering individuals and that does create a ripple effect and by sharing positive stories of, of solutions and stories of change that grows, those ripples grow further and start to create an influence systems change driven by that groundswell of community engagement. And this is when we, we start to see the corporates making changes, when we start to see uh, legislative and policy changes um, from, from Air New Zealand to aquariums in South Africa, to that community in the Caribbean, to the state of New York, who officially proclaimed July as plastic free July in, uh, for the third year in a row. And over the last decade, um, I've seen state by state, uh, led by South Australia, or Australia that went in there, introduce plastic bag bans, 
container deposit scheme and state and federal governments now um, um, uh, introduce, uh, phasing out and banning uh, problematic single use plastics. So behaviour change is at the core of this change. It, it leads to the spread of ideas and shifts social norms. And it's this change in community expect, expectations that is putting the pressure on business and government and is the seed of, of cultural and systems change. And this isn't about a few people being perfect. Plastic Free July and that individual behaviour change is about lots of people making small changes that adds up to a collective difference. These are our figures for last year. We're still crunching this year, but over 300 million people took part avoiding millions of kilos of plastic waste and, and um, millions of tonnes of, of, of landfill waste as well. And 85% of people say that, that they've made long-term behaviour changes by just taking part in this challenge for a month. So thank you very much for listening to my story. It is an inspiring story that we, uh, myself and Joanna Atherfold Finn, a New South Wales uh, writer wrote uh, the book about last year. And if you're interested, you're welcome to read more about that there. And I hope that if you haven't done so before, you too can join us and make a difference. Thanks very much. Wow, what, a, what an incredible and inspiring story. Like uh, how do you start out with a simple idea, um, a relevant idea, and in 10 years have over 300 million people worldwide contributing to it. I'm, I'm in awe, I really don't know what to say. Um, it's something that we face all the time. I've, I've witnessed um, or seen firsthand some of the plastics that they pull out of the Shearwater Chicks on Lord Howe Island, having worked there as well myself. Um, you know, it, it's really a, a visual that sticks with you for quite a while, seeing that plastic in the gut of something that hasn't actually been out to forage for itself. Um, you know, I think back, it wasn't that long ago that we were all using disposable coffee cups, yet nowadays you'd be lucky to find anyone that actually accepts one from a, from a cafe. Um, and really being able to inspire behavioural change is just incredible. And it's something that I face and a lot of my colleagues face on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. So, yeah, what an incredible, incredible story. Um, so moving along, our next presenter is Tim Lowe. Tim was a 2011 Churchill Fellow. He's a biologist and best-selling author of seven books on nature and conservation. His seventh book, Where Songs Began, was the first nature book to win the Australian Book Industry Award for Best General Nonfiction. In total, four of his books have won national prizes. He works as an environmental consultant and has written many reports on climate change for Commonwealth and state governments. And interestingly, he's also had a species of lizard named in his honour. So without further ado, over to you, Tim. There are two big statements we can make about climate change. One is it's a big threat to us, to humanity. And the other is that it's a threat to other species, to wildlife, to nature. And you could argue that it's a greater threat to us than it is to nature for a couple of reasons. One is that we measure threats differently. So if we think about what climate change could do to say koalas or platypuses, they've already suffered massive declines in the last 200 years because of habitat loss and so forth. So if they went through a 1% decline from climate change in the next 10 years, that wouldn't actually count for much in the way we look at their future. Whereas if humans went through a 1% decline in the next 10 years, that would be absolutely catastrophic. And the other thing is that, uh, all the native species in Australia, they've been here a lot longer than we have. So uh, they've been through climate change before. And if you look at a headline like that one at the bottom of the page, Earth is warmer than for 125,000 years, that can sound frightening from the point of view of us. But um, for species that have been around a million years or millions of years, it, the, the present climate isn't necessarily something they haven't seen before. And I saw evidence of that on, on my Churchill Fellowship of uh, warming 
being something that has been experienced before. There's a climate change walk you can do on Mount Gretrigid in northern Sweden, where you can see that uh, the, the tree line is rising, that young trees are coming up on slopes that have none. But when you get to this clump of trees and get close, you see that there's a very old tree trunk. It's this old Pompeii. It's been carbon dated as 5,000 700 years old so it's been too uh, cold for it to grow for over 5,000 years and now it's sprouting again. Now in terms of our information about climate change it's the most important source of information globally has been the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC a body of the United Nations and those who don't want to uh, see action on climate change they will attack the credibility of this organization. It's uh, put together by a huge number of scientists from everywhere in the world, including Australia. Unfortunately, it has put out some very bad predictions and you've only got to go back to the 2007 assessment to see examples of that for Australia. So if you look at that page from the report I've got on Australia and New Zealand, the two blue arrows show two predictions for Australia that have been woefully um, incorrect. So prediction of a 63% decrease of golden bowerbirds in northern Australia and a 50% decrease in montane tropical rainforests in northern Australia. Now that second prediction, we, we haven't actually had any decrease in montane rainforest area and it's now 2021. And the golden bowerbirds have lost a little bit of habitat, but not, nothing that's... Um, of much significance. Another quote I've got there on the other side of the page, talking about a significant loss of biodiversity. That means a loss of species projected for 2020 by sites, including the barrier reef and the wet tropics. That hasn't happened at all. There haven't been any species lost yet. Now, if you look at global predictions, uh, extinctions, of course, are very significant. And um, 2007, the IPCC was giving very high confidence that these frog and toad extinctions in Central America had happened because of climate change. And seven years later, they were walking back from that. You can see the quotes in bold there, the role of climate change is now the subject of considerable debate, very low confidence. Uh, in actual fact, the frogs died from a disease from Asia. It was a pathogen that knocked them out. It was nothing to do with climate change. Uh, it, was, it was quite quite poor science in the first case, but you can see in a seven year period going from very high confidence to very low confidence about extinctions. And these were the only extinctions being reported back in 2007. Uh, now, skeptics have jumped onto these examples as reasons not to take climate change seriously, which is uh, very unfortunate. I mean, I've got no uh, sympathy for someone like Dellen Pohl, but he's quite um, justified in criticising those scientists who um, embrace these frog extinctions. I'll have to say, uh, most frog scientists did not embrace those extinctions, but they were written up by the IPCC. So um, unfortunately, uh, they've become a valid target for criticism. Now, on my Churchill Fellowship, I saw evidence of um, scientists willing to uh, accept dishonest information. So he was someone at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, telling me how there's virtually no climate change scepticism in Switzerland because everyone can see that the glaciers are melting dramatically. You've got websites showing that melting. Now, I um, saw melting glacier in Alaska, and it's clear that a lot of that melting doesn't have anything to do with anthropogenic climate change. And this is what I said to the Swiss scientists. I said, look, isn't a lot of this warming just to do with Europe coming out of the last ice age? And he said, yeah, but the public doesn't know that. And I felt quite uncomfortable with the idea that you are using this dishonest information, even when the reason to use it is, is of global importance. And so in Alaska, I could see signs like, this is where the glacier was in 1917, all these different dates marked out, and it's clear that it was melting well before you had very high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, given that we had these exaggerated predictions, and if you only got to go back to 2007, a lot of people were willing to take them very, very seriously. There's uh, uh, you know, different thinking now. It raised a lot of questions about how we manage natural habitats and species. So, for example, should climate change be prioritised over other threats. Well, I think people today would say, well, well, no, in many cases, for most species, they're not 
uh, suffering any impacts from climate change. So uh, there's no particular management you could do. Uh, scientists have certainly walked back from the idea that we should move a lot of species into colder uh, parts of the landscape. So another question that's come up is ecological restoration futile. So some scientists have said, well, look, um, all species got to move all over the landscape. So if you're replanting your local gully with the uh, seeds collected from the local vicinity, these aren't going to be appropriate in, under climate change because you'll need seeds from a hotter climate. Now, we've had one degree of, of warming and there's, there's no evidence of any plants not being able to cope with one degree of warming. Um, and greenhouse experiments would indicate they could cope with a couple of degrees. So uh, I, th I think you know, we shouldn't say that ecological restoration is futile, that if we can stop climate change at two degrees or under two degrees, then the kind of ecological restoration going on is, is well worth doing. I'd have to say that the ecological restoration I saw on my travels, like, such as there in um, Lake and Heath, uh, what they were saying was a climate change impact. There was always something else, something human as well that was going on, such as um, diversion of water, uh, some kind of land use change that was contributing to them to talking about a climate change impact. A couple of other questions. Should we abandon the idea of the native species? So some people are saying, well, species have got to move. They can't stay where they are. So the, the idea of the native distribution it doesn't make sense anymore. So we, we can't talk about species as being native to one place. But once again, if we accept that these modeling predictions have turned out to be uh, exaggerated, I think we can talk about the native species. Another question, should we encourage species to move? This is um, a very interesting one because um, some species are moving. Now, in Australia, this is really only happening in marine environments. That's because we have really strong south flowing currents that can carry eggs and larvae south. And the East Australian current it is warming much more than global air temperatures are. And so we've had a whole lot of fish move from mainland Australia south into Tasmania. And also this long spine sea urchin, which is wiping out kelp beds and leaving these urchin barrens that you can see there. And this is considered a catastrophe for biodiversity. Uh, and the efforts underway are to stop these sea urchins, to kill them, to save the Tasmanian ecosystems from this movement. There's a scientific paper about another example uh, from the New South Wales coast where kelp in its northernmost uh, growth areas, it's disappearing, not because the temperatures are too high for kelp, but because the higher temperatures have allowed some fish to move south which eat, eating the kelp, wiping it out. And so once again, um, this is bad movement. And so um, we can now start to question the idea that the idea of encouraging species to move along corridors, the idea that we should be creating big corridors across the landscape, that's looking very questionable because the species that are moving, uh, as one would expect, the common species, successful species, not the ones that we actually need to move to survive. They, rare species at threat from extinction, uh, they tend to have very small populations. They're stuck up on the tops of mountains. Moving is not really something that um, they can do. Now, if we go back to, uh, I was criticizing this prediction about a 50% decrease in tropical rainforest in Northern Australia. So where did this really bad prediction come from? So uh, most of these bad predictions are based on modeling studies and so what was done was it was quite sensible in um, the, uh, the, the methods that we use. It was a matter of looking at the mountain slopes in North Queensland, where you have tall tropical rainforest on the lower slopes. And then when you get above a certain altitude, it switches over into a montane rainforest where the leaves are smaller and the trees are shorter. And so it's possible to look at where that altitudinal line is on the mountains and say that, if we get a one degree rise in temperature, that line will move so far upslope that the area of montane rainforest will halve. So that was a, a fair enough as a process, but what didn't happen was a consideration of how that line will move. Now we know from greenhouse studies that the montane trees, they can actually tolerate 
quite high temperatures, much higher temperatures than they're getting. And so that what is actually the threat to them? It's not climate change directly. It is the lowland trees moving up slope and replacing them. And the way this happens is that when a montane tree dies of old age, a lot of seedlings come up in the understory. Some of these will be of lowland trees. Birds are moving the seeds around and these will grow faster. They'll grow taller. So they'll be able to outgrow the montane trees and eventually you'll get a change over into montane rainforest. But this, this could take hundreds of years. It could take a very long period of time. Certainly not going to happen when the temperatures change. This is why we're not seeing a change. But it also means in terms of management that there is a possibility of actually weeding out those lowland trees so that the montane seedlings become the ones that do survive in the future. Now, on my travels, I got to see an uh, illustration of how these montane trees can tolerate higher temperatures. So here's Sonia Whip. She's quite critical of these climate modelling studies because she studies the um, lifestyles of the alpine plants. Around her house in Davos in Switzerland, she's planted an alpine garden. So you can see at the bottom left all of these alpine plants growing very happily well below the altitudes at which they naturally grow. And they were spreading along her pavement cracks in her courtyard. So here's clear, clear evidence that they are very happy growing at these higher temperatures. And what, what does it mean? It means that the reason these plants can't naturally grow at these lower altitudes is because they're shaded out by shrubs and large trees. And so that if we can manage shrubs and large trees, we can save the, the alpine flora in a large measure. So if we come to Alpine Australia, uh, there are some uh, snowbank habitats that are in big trouble from a more dry climate. But the other habitats, the vegetation communities, they are more at risk from species moving upslope than they are from temperatures getting higher. So we have the Alpine herb field communities, big problems faced for them by wallabies moving up slope and browsing them out of existence. Uh, snow gums starting to move up slope. So I read a quote in one climate change report, should snow gums be considered weeds if they invade these areas? So once again, we have this possibility that if um, lands in the landscape of Mount Kosciuszko area, if we had teams of volunteers weeding out the snow gums, uh, we could maintain these habitats long enough that we hope greenhouse gas emissions could be reined in. We stop climate change from going above a certain level. We get temperatures down again and that we can conserve these habitats in the long term. Of course, if climate change goes up four degrees, then everything I'm saying is, is meaningless, but we, we aren't at that stage yet. So I can ask this question. There's a lot of talk about have we entered an Anthropocene, a, a new era in which humanity totally dominates. I mean, I really see more a multiplicene where there's a whole group of species that are benefiting in the world today and that environmental management, it isn't just about curving the activities of us, of humans, but these other species such as sea urchins, wallabies and snow gums. Now, if we think back to the example of these frogs that went extinct, the golden toad uh, from Costa Rica, this was used by Paul Crutzen to argue that we should inject sulfur into the atmosphere to stop climate change. He's saying, look, we're getting climate change extinctions. We need to take these drastic steps. So as Paul Crutzen was the Nobel Prize winning chemist who popularised the word the Anthropocene. But now that we know that these extinctions were actually caused by um, a, a pathogen, a disease from Asia that spread to the Americas and into Australia where it's caused extinctions here. If we are to learn from these frog extinctions, it really is that we have to be much more careful about stopping pathogens moving around the world. And I think with um, COVID, living in the COVID age, it's much easier to get that message heard as a, as a message of environmental management. And I have just put at the bottom of this page that you know, I do want to emphasise that Many scientists all through recent decades have been doing very, very good research, uh, giving us a roadmap for how we should do environmental management. It's just that their studies giving milder predictions about what would happen under climate change, they weren't the uh, 
research findings that were documented in newspaper articles, and they weren't the uh, research findings that were highlighted by the IPCC. So it does mean that we know what to do. It just partly means that we shouldn't be uh, confused by the more dramatic predictions. So um, I want to thank, thank you very much for the Churchill Fellowship. Uh, it gave me a chance to really work these ideas through. So um, before I did the fellowship, I had concerns about these predictions. I could see that within Australia, we had um, milder predictions and dramatic predictions. Uh, it was too early at that stage to know which ones would come true, but I could see theoretical reasons to doubt the, um, the more dramatic ones. And I used the fellowship to, I gave uh, seminars, including at the University of East Anglia. I gave a lunchtime talk there where I put out my ideas, my concerns about climate change. I thought that if I can, um, if my thinking can survive being uh, critiqued in places like the University of East Anglia, which is pretty much the world's centre for climate change research, it's where climate gate happened, then it, it, it should give me some solidity to what I'm doing. And so I did come back very gratified to find that there are lots of scientists in the Northern Hemisphere sharing concerns about the uh, uh, overly dramatic predictions and that um, it has made me confident in my writing. So in fact, I'm writing two books where uh, I'm using these um, findings from the Churchill Fellowship to talk about um, what climate change does mean for the environmental future. So um, um, thank you very much for that. It's um, been great to present here today. Well, what, what another great talk. And that's something that I'm quite passionate about, obviously, is climate change and, and natural ecosystems. Um, really thought provoking talk, uh, Tim. Uh, you touched on one point there that, you know, a lot of the restoration effect um, efforts are going into areas that are impacted by climate change, but also by uh, local human stresses, if you like. And, and that's where I think we really can make a change. And, and showing how climate change might not be influencing, you know, the ability of, a, of a, an animal or a plant to occupy a certain habitat, but really the interactions amongst the components of that ecosystem and how that can um, direct change in their distribution really well, for me, really fascinating stuff. Um, so moving right along and in the interest of time, um, our, next present, our next presentation is from a, a co-presentation from Scott Faulkner, who was a 2017 Churchill Fellow, and Trent Nelson. So Scott is the, direct, is the Deputy Chief Fire Officer and Director of Forest and Fire Operations for the Victorian Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Now, Scott, Together with Trent Nelson, the director of the Jaja Wurrung, I hope I got that correct, uh, Trent, plans Aboriginal Corporation have been instrumental in the reintroduction of Indigenous cultural burning in central Victoria for the first time in over two centuries. Um, over to you both. No worries. Uh, Delkaya, uh, everybody, uh, which means hello in my, my language and my grandfather's language. Um, my name's Trent Nelson. I'm a proud uh, Yorta Yorta Jajarung man. And uh, I guess for today's uh, presentation, I'd just like to acknowledge um, all the traditional owners that may be online today or viewing, uh, as well as also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we all meet on today. And fortunately enough, uh, we're lucky enough to, for Scott and I to meet on my grandfather's country, Jajaburung country in central Victoria today. Um, and we're, we're really humbled to be able to do this and, and present um, the good work that we've been doing in this uh, in this space of cultural fire. Thanks a lot, Trent. And um, look, we're both really thrilled and honoured to be here and to hear the other guest uh, presenters, frankly, a little bit humbled to be in this company. Um, and I say we're here, we're actually still locked down in Victoria, so we're virtually here. Um, but look, today, Trent and I want to talk about some really important work that's been undertaken between fire and land management agencies and traditional owners in Victoria that started here in central Victoria, but um, spread out right across the state in quite um, amazing and probably ways we didn't think would five years ago when we started this work. Uh, we think it's a very unique and special partnership, um, really focused on returning cultural fire uh, to land um, as a way of managing um, the environment essentially and country as Trent would say. Now we want to share a short video that we made with local traditional owners in fact Trent's mob from Jaja Run 
a number of years ago when we were returning um, fire to country, to that country, Jara, for 170 years. Uh, I'm thrilled that we, we made that video because I think it really captures the heart of what this is all about. Um, and I think it's very much in keeping with the theme of this conference about a changing world and, and listening to Tim and uh, climate change and devastating fires. I don't need to talk much about that. We're all aware of that here and in the Northern Hemisphere. So in this instance, it's change that's leading to um, critical cultural, social and economic outcomes for Aboriginal uh, communities, as well as important environmental uh, outcomes as well. So I'll just get you to play the video, please. The mission today is to do traditional burn. Part of doing this traditional burn is to heal country the whole way. We're in the Murray Goldfields district of Loddon Mallee region. This is based in central Victoria around Bendigo. And what we're doing is undertaking a project with the Jar Jar Rung people of traditional burning. This is a practice that hasn't been done for you know 170 70 years plus. So we're picking that, uh, that flame, that light up from our ancestors where they dropped it and we're continuing that flame on. So that's, for me, that's very, very special that I'm doing it with my mob and my, my family, so to speak. I feel proud to care for country on behalf of my family. Uh, I feel very proud. Getting back to healing ourselves, just doing our traditional stuff, what we used to do, and uh, it means a lot. Yeah, it means a lot. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, that's actually a short take of a longer video that's available online. If you look at uh, Janda Kui, uh, you can see that on YouTube. Um, and I might just go back a step and how did all this begin? Well, the first crucial step was when the state of Victoria recognised the legal rights and connection to the country of Zha Zha Rung. Um, this was formally achieved through a 2013 Zha Zha Rung recognition settlement agreement. And I know this sounds a bit dry, but it really is crucial. And this established the legal partnership between Jar Jar Rung Clans Aboriginal Corporation, which actually is the chair of, um, and the state of Victoria. Um, and this was the first one of its kind, so everything was very new. Equally important was the building of trust and genuine relationships that started rather innocuously uh, with the informal meeting that I had in a cafe in Bendigo, where, where I live here, uh, with Rob Carter, who's the CEO, and asked him the question, you know, what is it, Rod, that you'd like to do and see in the fire and land management space? And he said, and I'm glad I wrote it down at the time, we want to see white smoke across our country and know that our people are using fire to garden the landscape once again. Next slide, please. So, so we had this great sort of high-level, almost poetic vision, but what, what, how do we do it? And where could we go to learn other things? So we were working with other mobs in Australia and, and agencies, including fire sticks that some in the audience may be aware of. Um, but recognising there were efforts to reintroduce cultural burning in other jurisdictions, particularly in the US and Canada, and I had some networks there, and wanting to learn from them and exchange knowledge and build ongoing networks, uh, I applied and was uh, awarded the Lord Mayor's Bushfire Appeal Churchill Fellowship to investigate how to create partnerships with traditional owners and to focus on enabling the reintroduction of cultural burning practices. And in 2018, and I, Trent and I traveled to the USA and Canada, um, met with a lot of agencies and tribes, a, a remarkable trip, I have to say, and still grateful uh, to the Churchill Trust for that. Um, and, and one of the first steps was, I didn't feel right going as a non-Aboriginal person. And that's how Trent came to come on the journey. And so did another Aboriginal man, Tim Kanoa, my organization were good enough to, um, to fund that as well. Um, so I might get Trent to yeah, look, describe this I think, photo. Scott, um, this photo really, I guess, for us and for me as an as a Aboriginal person here, going uh, across, across country to another continent and meeting another traditional owner group and Indigenous peoples from there, seeing where we are in that, that um, image there really portrays how across two continents, I suppose, how cultural burning can be implemented similarly um, across an Indigenous people. So that area um, had recently, six months prior to that, had a cultural burn put through there to actually promote the use of um, a, a yam that's in the ground um, called camas, and it's a purple flower that comes up. And similar to us, um, I guess, in terms of our Murrinong, our yam daisy um, that we have here on Jara country, 
um, we use the same method in terms of burning to promote that that yam, that tuber, but it's a yellow flower. So I was really amazed by that, and I was really humbled to be able to be there with Scott and uh, at, and Tim as well. And and thanks, Trent. And and I think um, what really struck me as a fire and land manager of many years, even decades, um, was the perception of a restored landscape as elders wanted it, rather than what may have traditionally been there in the first place, was was a really important lesson. Um, next slide, please. So I guess in terms of uh, this slide here, you can see this is one of our cultural burns that was um, uh, up at uh, north of, of Bendigo, uh, up in a sort of swamp land called Bort. Um, for us, really around healthy country and the benefits of cultural fire really, I guess, supports us in to heal the land as Aboriginal people. Um, we all know for 60,000 years plus, our people used the land, they, they cultivated the land, they propagated the land. And the land wasn't just, a, uh, I guess, a, an area that was taken. It was actually a, an area that was used as a garden. It was uh, gardening the environment, as we like to speak. Um, I guess for us, though, when we, we go out on country and we look at areas that we want to introduce cultural fire, for us it's it's around not just um, implementing that fire for fuel treatment. It's actually about um, you know, creating a healthy country for us again. You know? So in, in stowing, um, I guess, our cultural protocols as Aboriginal people that our ancestors instowed in us, bringing that back and having our families uh, you know, our young ones, our elders back on country again and, and lighting using that flame technique is really important and using the fire stick. For us, um, this actually is really good for us, I suppose, to to create that opportunity to actually heal ourselves. You know, we all go through mental health through our communities and our people and it's not just about healing country, it's about healing our people. And we've, the only way we can do that is actually by having our people back in the landscape. So... I guess for us being out there and to walk through those flames um, and to have that cool burn go through that that grassland and those areas for us really dictates to us, you know, it tells us our old people are telling us, you know, we're doing the right thing and that white smoke coming up, um, you know, we breathe that in and, and that cleanses us and makes us healthy. Next slide, please. So, yeah, well, I'll keep going with this. So this, this uh, actually, it's probably a good timing we're doing this presentation today because uh, as you see in this slide, this slide is um, of uh, Barappa, Barappa people um, up along the Murray River in Victoria, uh, which is our, our neighbours of the Jaja Um And this, this burn that we're doing was at a swampland, Reedy Swamp, um, a few years ago that, that actually, uh, I guess, was really a, a starting point for them as well to be out on country. So it's not just the Jar Jar it's all of our other neighbours and traditional owner groups, families and clan groups that are out there actually using this technique. Um, and this weekend, uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, we're actually going to be heading back out with the Barappa Barappa and continuing doing uh, you know more cultural burns with them up around the northern area of the grasslands around Kerrang. So it's a really good time for us, uh, I guess, at the moment to be out there burning country with the people and, and try and get them, um, you know, getting healthy and healing from, uh, I suppose, what we've been going through with COVID as well. Next slide. So th this is actually, um, these are lessons and recommendations that came out of uh, the report that we did when we came back from overseas. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just summarise them. Uh, obviously, my report's available online. Um, but then here's some key lessons that, that we think are really relevant even now that we've been working in, in this space for more than five years. Um, one is, uh, as I alluded to before, was that legal rights and connection of Aboriginal people to country must be recognised. Um, trust is critical and can't stress that enough um, and must be established between parties, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. Um, this must be built over time and is a key to forming that meaningful partnership, which we refer to as walking together. And, and I'd say as a, an agency director that the cultural change that's happened within the organisation in terms of understanding and respecting Aboriginal people, uh, treating them as, as genuine partners and leaders in land management has been quite uh, remarkable and appropriate. Um, and probably third, but perhaps most important, that self-determination has always been the driver driving the principle of this collaboration. We think it should be in other jurisdictions also. This means that traditional owners lead the process at their pace with sustained support and resourcing from governments and their agencies right through the planning and delivery 
are burning, and that's led to employment of people like Trent within the organisation and many others as well. Um, next slide, thank you. <clears throat> on, on, a, on a state level, the, the progress that we've made to date has been unexpected. There's more than 120 burns, and Trent will talk about this plan for the next three years. Um, we didn't anticipate that, it's a great and pleasant surprise. But we also need to um, establish national Indigenous policy and partnership groups to bring together representatives from fire and emergency management agencies to work with traditional owners and agencies to do the following three key things. Um, identify and remove regulatory and social barriers to traditional owners' ability to manage fire. Now, I have to say that is a 20-minute um, presentation in its own right, that, that point, and it's very complex. There is an opportunity to create a national Indigenous-led network of fire practitioners, and I talked about fire sticks um, earlier, um, and the Bush Fire Natural Hazard CRC is working on an enhanced collaboration paper that Trent and I have been invited to have input into as well. Um, and, the, and the other one, and this is because traditional owners are saying this to us, is that we really need to support them to develop a, and lead a science-based research program that aligns with their cultural fire initiatives and is respectful to their intellectual property and traditional ecological knowledge. Next slide, thanks. So as you can see, um, the slide there depicts the Victorian traditional owner cultural fire strategy. Um, for us, I guess, here in central Victoria, from 2017 when we started this uh, igniting this fire back on country, for us, we, we utilised that with the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owners Corporations to come together with other um, traditional owner groups to actually build a document that actually can be utilised um, at that high level in government as a, as a guideline approach into how we implement cultural fire for traditional owners uh, as a strategy. So I guess the um, strategy outlines four pragmatic um, areas for fire agencies to invest in. So um, they are developing pathways in institutional frameworks for tr transition of sick country to a healthy country. That can be safely managed in a traditional way, in a cultural way. Supporting the restoration, um, further development and knowledge transfer and governance of cultural fire knowledge and practice. So that's intellectual property agreements and, and understanding that, um, you know, how we do business, you know, as a day-to-day -day model, really integrating that with, with cultural knowledge and cultural uh, intellectual property and how that can be protected, I guess, with, with tr for traditional owners for the future. Um, traditional owners to lead the planning and management of public reserves and for those reserves to be managed accordingly for traditional owner knowledge and practice, enabling the use of cultural fire for multiple objectives, including healing country and people, as I talked about before, most important. Um, last and foremost, sort of embedding cultural fire practices within fire management. And that's what's, I guess, so great about this partnership is that um, we, a lot of our processes that we do with cultural fire, um, they're all embedded within, dealt within forest fire management processes. So they don't stand alone. They're actually, the way we plan our burns, the way we deliver those burns are in partnership with the agency. So um, for us, we call that, um, Scott mentioned it before, Nalbarong Yana in our language, which means walking together, um, which is really important. So um, I guess, since 2017... Uh, um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's good he's on the ball. <laughs> um, so this, this slide's really important to me. I guess that's... that's They're my elders that are there. Um, really important. And my cousin, Mick Burke, uh, who's, who's been leading this this cultural fire program as well. And um, you'll see there in the centre, Lily D'Ambrosio, a, a Minister for Environment. Um, at that time, I guess that was really important for us to, to be out there on country when she endorsed that. Um, I guess that strategy and, and, and have that out on the ground with our elders to perform ceremony, but also to perform our first cultural burn was so amazing. Um, you know, so moving forward from that, I guess on Jara country, um, and Jad, when I mean Jara country, I mean um, Jad Jaburan country. We call ourselves Jara as people. So just not for people to be confused. Um, more than sort of 40 cultural burns have been implemented, um, you know, across Victoria since then. So that's where that flame has started to build, so to speak, um, you know, right across Victoria to other traditional owner groups, which is which has just been amazing. Um, at the moment, you know, we've got 120 uh, that are planned for the next three years. 
that are you know nominated especially in our area by sort of six different traditional owner groups now for us that's really important that our traditional owner groups are out there nominating their burns where they want to implement them they're not being told where they can implement them on the ground so a lot of our areas are on public land so national parks, state forests, they're actually out there nominating these burns themselves and we're working with them um, as the government agency has dealt to actually support them in planning and implementing them so they're conducted safely and actually the, the uh, cultural heritage but also cultural value, values are actually protected and traditional owners can get out there and deliver them in their own way, um, which, is, which is really important um, for us. So I guess in terms of uh, the bigger picture, the Victorian government has provided ongoing funding directed traditional owners to establish a Victorian cultural fire leadership group as well, which is is just thought, just starting to sort of take off now, um, which I think is going to be a really key point in leading the next next realm, I think, for the next few years of cultural fire uh, across the traditional owner groups and actually building better capacity in the groups to, to have um, people out on the ground in full-time positions, planning and delivery, uh, and working, you know, as well with with the department on a day to day basis, even more to build their capacity. So really important. Thanks, Trent. And um, I think that that formalising and systematising, I think that's a word, um, of of things through the fire strategy, as well as this new Victorian Traditional Culture Fire Leadership Group, are incredibly um, uh, innovative and and groundbreaking. Frankly, uh, really in keeping with. Uh, principles of self-determination. Um, next slide, please. And this is the final slide. Um, so um, Trent and I are also really fortunate to be able to go up to Canberra earlier this year and talk um, as part of a policy impact program that um, the Trust put together. Um, and I've just, this is a bit of a plug for that paper, um, which you'll see the link there. They'll give you a lot more detail and if it, it will be helpful for our other jurisdictions. Um, I guess in closing, look, we're still um, we're still really inspired. Um, these relationships are very, very well embedded in our respective organisations, um, and we're really looking forward to seeing what will happen in the future. And um, yeah, really want to sincerely thank you for inviting us here to talk on this subject today. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Scott and Trent, I don't know why you're worried about your talk. Um, you know, that, that was a truly amazing story. Um, you know, I picked up a few bits and pieces in there, but really it's distilled down to me for, you know, that bi-directional exchange of knowledge. Um, one thing, and I include myself in this as a, a Western scientist, if I may, that we really overlook the value of the knowledge that the traditional owners of land, and in my case, and sea country, have developed over tens of thousands of years. You know, effectively, you've been the scientists of this land and sea for, you know, um, thousands and thousands of years. So, you know, the, the other things I took about out of that was, you know, you mentioned walking together. Sorry, Trent, I can't say it in, in your, your language. Um, uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But the message is clear, you know, we should be working on this together. There's a lot of initiatives in my space working on the Great Barrier Reef and the sea country around it to do this. Um, totally inspiring story. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and our ne next speaker is Paul Donatiu. Um, he's a conservation expert and works on protecting lowland uh, subtropical rainforests, restoring threatened species and habitats, improving water quality and monitoring the health of marine and forest ecosystems. Paul's worked for the World, World um, Wildlife Fund, Greening Australia, National Parks Association of Queensland and volunteers for the Protect the Bush Alliance. In 2010, he undertook a Churchill Fellowship that examined how national agencies in Europe, USA and South Africa were dealing with climate impacts on protected areas. So over to you, Paul. Thank you. Um, and very hard to follow up on those amazing presentations that have been given to date, um, but a real privilege to be here this afternoon. And my heart really goes out to Trent and Scott. Um, it's just wonderful work that's happening in your part of the world. So. I want to begin today by acknowledging the Cubby Cubby, the Yugara Yugarapul, the Danga and Balan people, and they are the traditional custodians of the land which my presentation covers. 
Uh, I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I want to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So I've got a background with uh, conservation groups, but in 2010, I was very fortunate to uh, travel to five countries to look at what uh, five different national agencies were doing to look at the impact of climate change on their protected areas. And that's an interest that stayed with me since that time. Uh, the other things I'm really keen and passionate about are threatened species, threatened ecological communities. Uh, and I've retained that fascination with climate change and how climate change is impacting on these species. But it's obviously, as Tim has alluded to, it's not just climate change, there's a whole lot of other impacts as well. Today, I wanna to look at some species that I guess in my mind are living on the edge uh, for various reasons, not just climate change, to hopefully morph that into a discussion of a particularly rare vegetation community, one that I'm given a fantastic opportunity to work on at the moment, uh, how that's actually been impacted by the 2019 bushfire season, and then try to morph that into some work, uh, which is actually cultural heritage work in, in the Moreton Bay Ramsar wetland, uh, which does have a relationship with bushfire as well. So let's start with a, a few species. So macadamia trees, uh, most people would think that macadamias are actually pretty common, uh, but the actual wild populations are incredibly rare. All four species are listed, three is vulnerable, one is endangered. Uh, they have these awesome flowers and fruit of which we all appreciate the latter. And if you take a drive in my part of the world, which is Southeast Queensland through the hinterland valleys of the Gold Coast, you'll find some of these wild populations in situ are uh, still hanging on, uh, but they're reducing in size, you know, and they are being lost because they favour that lowland subtropical rainforest community. And that's the that's a community that's being lost in this part of the world. A couple of years ago, I had an awesome opportunity to work on um, this particular rainforest tree, Brachychiton species Ormo. It's listed as critically endangered. Uh, it's a 20 metre tree, but not until the 1990s was it actually separated and determined to be a separate species to other brachycotons. There are only a little more than 200 species, actually 200, 200 individuals, sorry, left in the wild. But a couple of years ago, we got uh, federal funding to actually do some survey work to see whether these mature trees were persisting and whether there had been any regeneration. What we found since the last survey work had been done, which was 2009, was 500 plus juveniles, but it came with a dilemma. All the juveniles were actually regenerating in different communities to the parent trees. So in the ecotones and particularly in the dry sclerophyll communities beside these dry rainforest remnants, which presented for us a real management dilemma in terms of how we use fire in these areas that abut the mature trees. So something that carries on to today. If we use fires as we would traditionally to manage the dry scale for remnants, we'd lose the juveniles and we'd back to that core population. So, but a really interesting, resilient tree that has persisted for, you know, quite a long time. How we allow it to expand is something that's still up and being debated. Some people will dis dispute whether this is our tallest orchid, but this is Fires australis, the giant swamp orchid. It's listed as endangered. And it inhabits these incredible, uh, beautifully, beautiful coastal wetland communities uh, right through the coast of southeast Queensland and into uh, uh, northern New South Wales as well. In the past, certainly these plants were threatened by the cut flower trade. Um, but now, because of the habitat that they favour, which is these Mal Malaluka wetlands, if those areas are allowed to dry and if wildfire gets into there, and that wildfire takes out the peat foundation of this particular orchid, then we lose this species. So a really interesting species that is subject to the impacts of, of warming and a drying, a drying climate, but obviously also heavily impacted by um, habitat change and habitat loss. Freshwater crayfish. So if you're in part of my world and you, you've, you visited Lamington, you probably know the Lamington blue, but here I'm actually talking about the dwarf species. And these are species that have really high levels of endemism and are often uh, just found solely on, on mountain peaks, particularly in the McPherson Ranges, uh, but, but beyond that as well. The one that I've highlighted here is Euastacus Mayday, and it's called the hinterland crayfish. 
only just recently listed as critically endangered and favours, again, some of those sort of hinterland valleys on the Gold Coast. And you can see from the photograph on the left just the type of community that this species is found within. And there's a very interesting relationship here between the species and, and some actual rainforest species. So in that small slide there beside the crayfish is a picture of native spinach. And where you, off, you find this native spinach, you will often find dwarf crayfish species. So as an indicator species, and with the impacts of things like uh, warming climate and, and drying and the loss of that species, it then we can start to figure out how much sort of climate change in particular will be having an impact on these dwarf crayfish. Shorebirds, um, lucky to live on the edge of the Moreton Bay Ramsar wetland, uh, but the one here I've highlighted is the Eastern Curlew, which is a critically endangered shorebird, uh, the largest migratory species. We have 10% of the world population, and it does like to feed off these sort of intertidal mudflats and sandflats. It breeds way up north in the Northern Hemisphere, um, but 75% of the total population actually winters in Australia. Now, in the uh, Broadwater on the Gold Coast, again, we have this incredible place called Kulu, Kulu Island. Um, and it's amazing given the backdrop of, of where these um, species choose to, to roost and to feed. And you can see surface paradise in the background of that photo there. Again, a really fascinating species, but obviously affected by recreation, particularly boat wash, things like jet skis, uh, sea level rise, and again, habitat loss, particularly in those coastal environments. I want to now talk about uh, an ecological community that I've uh, had the privilege to be able to work, work in quite a bit in the last couple of years. And I've talked to it or alluded to it before in terms of the macadamia species. So lowland subtropical rainforests. So in the federal government's Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, it does list uh, the threatened ecological communities. And this is one of those ecological communities. And it's actually listed as critically endangered. And that means that less than 10% of this community actually remains. And in fact, for this particular community, in fact, it's just about 7%. You can see example in, in places like Austinville, again on the Gold Coast, at the base of Springbrook and Lamington. Uh, but this is one of the communities that was severely affected by the 2019 bushfire season. And I will go and talk about that a little bit now. So in the 2019 fire, particularly the one that swept up the Illanbar Valley and went into Lamington National Park, uh, the, the northern communities of the National Park were heavily impacted by, by fire. So this was a day at the end of um, September uh, where the temperatures were in the low, uh, the, sorry, the high, the, the low 30s, there was practically no humidity. Uh, there'd been uh, a drying period for, for quite a while leading up to this time and fire raced up that valley. And this is a fire that ultimately actually took out the lodge at Binnaburra. Now the fire that, that came into the park actually came in and did start to impact rainforest communities in Lamington National Park. And there's a whole different range of, of damage done. There was damage done to the canopy. There was a series of tree fall during and after the fire event. Uh, weeds started to get established, particularly in canopy banks, uh, sorry, in, in canopy gaps. And then there, there was damage to soil seed banks as well. So some of the impacted species were certainly the rainforest plants themselves, but also frogs, particularly some, again, of, of our freshwater crayfish, invertebrates, and some bird species as well. So you can see by these slides, some of the, the weeds that were actually taking over after the, the fire went through. So some of the vines, some of the woody weeds, such as devil's fig. I talked about tree fall before and how that created a whole series of different disturbances after the fire. And you can see that low uh, panorama shot there where a whole canopy was lost in, in subtropical rainforest in the Eelanbar section of Lamington National Park. But how we were able to respond to that was to focus on uh, the park areas that were fire impacted. And we did basically two things. We wanted to tackle the weeds that were sort of transforming this environment uh, into a, a ecologically compromised environment. And we were also able to spend some money on boundary fencing to, to keep cattle out. 
but it presented us with an interesting dilemma. And that dilemma was that, um, you know, what type of restoration approach do we take within this fire damaged environment? And how are the plants in this environment actually responding to fire? Are they resprouting? Are they obliged to come back by seed? Are they doing a bit of both? And how is fire intensity affecting that response? And I guess the other overlay for that was, well, how are the, what plants are actually coming back? And you may know if you've looked at rainforest ecology that rainforest plants are broken up into four broad groups. So you have your pioneer species that come back straight after disturbance, your early and later secondary species, which come sometime later once a pioneers have formed a canopy and restored a canopy, and then your mature phase species. So would we have the same diversity in successional status in the, in the plants that were coming back and which ones were actually able to survive this fire event? So we did something which was quite simple. We just went out and actually photographed species that were starting to come back as a result of these fires. And it was, we found some really, really interesting results. So of the first 100 species that we were able to identify, 93 rainforest species actually re-sprouted. Five came back from seed and two were killed outright. And uh, without, they, were, they were both palms. But the interesting thing was, is when you looked at those species, particularly those that were re-sprouting, almost half were mature phase species. So it great, gave us great confidence that if we could tackle and solve the weed incursion problem, that the actual fundamentals of a diverse rainforest were still there, that the resilience was there for that forest to actually come back and to, to repair itself. Uh, you know, the fundamentals were right there. A little uh, interesting thing in terms of that photograph on the bottom right, uh, you know, rainforest species uh, attack on many fronts. Uh, the Rhodamnia has been recently listed as critically endangered. And you can see there it is resprouting, but it's also suffering from a pathogen called myrtle rust. So some of these species are still doing it tough. Along the way, we're actually able to make a few discoveries. So this is the joy of working in some of these environments. Uh, we went through, we're doing some survey work and we managed to make the first record for an uh, endangered species that hadn't popped up in Langton National Park before. It certainly was there. We were just the first people really to take note of it. So this has evolved to another project where they're now looking at this the host species for this endangered moth, uh, how uh, extensive it is and whether there is a viable population in the park. Of course, there are other listed communities and, and really what we were doing is really a starting point for how we do work in other places. And I want to, I guess, morph the conversation now into some of the work that we're doing on Bribey Island. Now, Broadway Island is, is part of the Moreton Bay Ramsar wetland. It's a fascinating place to be able to work. Uh, and you can see there the two pictures of uh, two listed EPBC communities. So one is literal rainforest and the panorama there at the top is a evolving literal rainforest. It's certainly not a mature one behind four dunes on Bribey. Um, go to the black and white and that's actually Cavill Avenue in surface paradise in the 1920s. So you can imagine the extent of this community in the past, but it's now critically endangered because most of its habitat has actually been lost or completely changed. Salt marsh, the other one there at the bottom is, is a vulnerable community also on Bribey Island, finds itself in the interesting nexus between mangroves and uh, swamp oak or casuarinas, she oaks, uh, an area that is starting to get crimped by sea level rise um, and again, a community that's really uh, valuable, but is also threatened by a whole range of threatening processes. In terms of the work that we're doing on Bribey Island, uh, how some of this started was looking at how we can better manage fire for some of these ecological communities, particularly those that were listed under federal legislation. But when we started to do that, um, one of the most important things for us was to work with traditional owners uh, who are looking to co-manage these areas. Native title's not far away in terms of this part of southeast Queensland, and we wanted to very much uh, respect uh, the cultural heritage values of, of Bribey. And the traditional owners obviously encouraged us to look at first identifying those values in full before we moved uh, on to the, the question of actually managing fire in some of the ecosystems on the island. And that led to two examples that I want to talk about today 
the ancestral Cyprus camps uh, that we are starting to work to protect on the island, plus an interesting association between middens and a particular plant. So one of the things that are really important to the local traditional owners, the Cubby Cubby people, are these remnant cypress pine communities. So some of these trees uh, have a girth of over uh, three metres. Uh, they're estimated to be in excess of a thousand years old, um, but they're also incredibly important midden sites. So you can see from the example in the top left hand corner, so there's shell scatter under remnant cypress pine on Bribey Island. And this is one of the very few, a few locations on the island where this community still exists. Uh, and it's absolutely critical that we protect this community from wildfire because cypress pines are easily killed by, killed by wildfire. And it's not so much the, the presence of other plants in the community itself, but it's the surrounding vegetation, which has had a complete lack of traditional cultural fire for you know over a couple of hundred years. One of the other interesting areas that we're, we're looking at is the, the ongoing identification of cultural heritage sites on the island. And there's a very fascinating association that uh, the archaeologists and Cubby Cubby people turned up in terms of um, the Cupaniopsis tree, which is Cupaniopsis and Archaeoides. Uh, the Tuckaroo, it's actually a street tree in Brisbane. But where you find a large Cupaniopsis tree, you will actually almost inevitably find a midden underneath, particularly on the leeward side of the island. And there's a great example here at Mission Point on Bribey Island. And in these areas, you'll find lots of art artifacts, including oyster picks that you can see there on the bottom right. So again, for us in terms of working, particularly with traditional owners, it's not so much obviously the rarity of these communities, but it's the incredible rarity of the uh, remaining cultural heritage values on these islands that needs to be identified and preserved. And that, that has been the mainstay of our work uh, for the last couple of years. There are obviously a lot of challenges in doing that. Uh, and a lot of those have been covered by other presenters. So I've talked about weeds in terms of that center picture and the, the matty ground cover there is, is, a, is a weed species that completely dominates the understory. Yes, there are interesting issues associated with sea level rise. So the image on the left is a uh, uh, forest red gum or Queensland blue gum uh, being swamped by a, a high level uh, uh, tide and obviously sea level rise and, and has, has actually has, has, has died. And then there are other issues in terms of the invasion of um, other species into to various communities and transforming I, I guess what those communities were in the past. So here on the right, you have a rainforest species invading a Malaluka wetland. And it was probably the Malalukas that actually invaded uh, that wetland in the first instance. So a, a few quick reflections in terms of um, what I've done since my fellowship, you know, 10 years ago. I mean, I'm very, very fortunate to live in a biodiversity hotspot where there are lots of listed uh, plants and animals. Um, but what we have seen, particularly in recent years, and particularly as a result of the 2019 bushfire season, is that there, are, there is a lot of resilience in some of these communities. And what has surprised us a lot is that the resilience has extended to things like rainforest communities. And if we take the right approach in terms of our intervention, we can actually manage these communities to, to fast track their recovery. Uh, it's also the, the work that I've done, it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to rethink you know, what is rare, particularly through a cultural heritage lens. And I can't um, over, you know, underestimate the importance of, of walking country with traditional owners and being able to progress uh, co-management of country. Thank you. Another, you know, inspiring talk, wonderful um, presentation there. You know, it, it really, I found that quite heartening and uplifting to see the resilience and recovery of those communities post fire. Um, you know, I, I am mindful of time, so I won't dwell too much on your presentation, Paul, but I, I'd like to ask everyone that's out there in the audience just to join me for a virtual uh, clap for all of the, the presenters in this session. Um, yeah, but absolutely incredible, um, the diversity of talks. And the one thing that really stood out for me throughout all of these was, you know, through the Churchill Fellowship Program, these people have gone over, brought that expertise 
back to Australia and had an actual impact in the way that we're doing things, the way we're approaching things, potentially government policies. And, you know, that's the whole aim of this, the, the scheme. It's incredible. So thank you. And I'd like to welcome back, if I can, everyone, the presenters. Yep. All right. Beautiful. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through. There's been quite a few questions come in. So the first one that I can see here is to you, Rebecca. Um, is it, and it's from Michael Power, is it more than July you are aiming for, i.e. how does it go in sustaining the behaviour change long term rather than being novel for a short term or short time? Yeah, look, um, thanks for your question, Michael. So um, the fact that it's just July is it's a good amount of time for people to take on the challenge and make some changes in their own behaviour. Um, we don't even ask people to do it for the month. We say, can you do it for a day? Can you try it for a week? Uh, do whatever you can. Um, but the, to me, actually the biggest reason why it's plastic free July and not all year is it makes it sustainable for me and our organisation. So it's good, really good. And it's become this now a global month of focus on the plastic pollution issue. So what we now see is other not-for-profits, organisations, uh, regulatory authorities, all uh, use July as a moment to tackle the plastic waste issue. So it's, it's so much bigger than ourselves and our organisation. Beautiful. Uh, the next one that come, that's come in is more of a comment, but I, I think I should share it with everyone. These presentations on plastic free July and cultural burning has, has nearly brought me to tears of joy. They, they show how beautifully, um, or so beautifully, the extensive power and influence of knowledge and vision enabled by the Churchill Trust. And so that was really a point I was trying to get across, but that's a lot more eloquent there by um, Helen Melissa. Next one from Estelle O'Callaghan to Tim and Jess. Has pandemic lockdowns had a positive impact on climate? Good question. Jess, did you want to go at that first? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's been a few studies done on this because obviously people locked down don't travel as much. Um, and studies have shown there's been about a 7% drop in emissions um, since 2019, mostly from transport. Um, but the critical thing and the test for us as a globe is going to be whether or not we can reduce emissions and keep them sustainably reduced when people and, and um, ecosystems and economy. Um, the, the ocean still does absorb a hell of a lot of heat. And so on the Great Barrier Reef, for example, even though we didn't have a bleaching event, a mass bleaching event last year, um, sea temperatures are still above average. And Tim, did you have anything you would like to add? No, I thought Jessica answered that very well. Um, I'm going to skip. There's a couple there more for Rebecca, but I'm just going to try and spread it out a little bit. Um, Scott and Trent, how long will it take to roll out cultural burning practices across Australia? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, from, from a traditional owner perspective, I guess um, that question is how long is a piece of string? So I guess... I can speak on behalf of Victoria and I think, look, I can see in the next five to ten years, um, you know, probably 90% of the traditional owner population down here in Victoria being actively participating in some form of cultural burning on their country and their land, whether that's on public land or whether it's on private properties um, or, you know, working with community. But I think that's that's probably where we're at at the moment, I guess, down here in Victoria. But Love to see it happen more broadly across Australia as well. I know there's a lot of work going on in all the various states around, um, you know, obviously working with fire management and fuel management and uh, having traditional owner cultural burning as forefront in delivering, uh, you know, back on country. So hope to see it happen very soon. Yeah, absolutely. And I saw a, a comment in the discussion forum earlier from my wife, Jess, um, who will be in touch with you about burning up and the uh, Great Barrier Reef catchment with Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. So that's another great connection between <laughs> one of the Churchill Fellows and, and initiated by this program. Um, so another one here to you, Tim. If the modelling seems, seems to overestimate the impact on environment of climate change on species and environment, then do you... 
I guess then, do you think the urgency for action to reduce emissions is vital? I think you're on mute, Tim. Oh, um, oh we got you now. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No. No. The, it matters are very, very urgent. I mean, I think the problem has just been that to try and uh, use impacts on nature as evidence that we need to act that some of that evidence has been exaggerated but it doesn't it doesn't you know we absolutely have to reduce emissions it's it's extremely important um, and you know i've got to say that the modeling studies they have always been controversial so they they never had a free run there were always scientists criticizing them it's just that obviously a dramatic modeling study will get media attention in a way that someone who's criticizing that study isn't going to get media attention I couldn't agree more. A um, couple more here. Rebecca, do you know if introduction of container refund schemes have had a positive impact on reducing plastic waste, increased recycling? Yeah, absolutely they have. So I just actually was quickly looking up the stats in, in Queensland um, since your scheme started there. It's 3.7 billion beverage containers returned. In Western Australia, we uh, just had our first year anniversary and it's 700 million, uh, 750 million beverage containers returned. And we know that recycling rates of beverage containers have doubled. And the great thing, one of the great things about container deposit schemes, it's um, it, they do re improve recycling outcomes and significantly impact litter. Beverage containers are always the most, uh, one of the most littered uh, items on our, in our environment. Um, but what, what happens when we're separating our beverage containers at source and returning them through return and earn or containers for change is that it's a much higher uh, quality recycling. So with the plastic beverage containers, for example, I mean, personally, I choose to, to not use them. I, I, I use my own and, and reduce my waste, but it can be, it's higher grade, so it can go bottle to bottle rather than being downcycled into a lesser value item such as um, synthetic, like, like polyester clothing or playground matting or bollards. So yeah, it's absolutely, you know, we need to reduce, but we also need to improve our recycling outcomes and having these forms of product stewardship are really important. And I've been really delighted to see the uptake of that around this country over the last five years. Yep, thanks. And another a quick one here um, for Scott and Trent. Okay, my question re-burning. Is the intent to also address mountain country and private land? Are you sure you are not brothers? <laughs> <laughs> Your Bro collaboration is beautiful to see. Bro brothers from a different mother is what my <laughs> wife says. Um, look, I, I think we're, we're looking at it 10 year blind on a serious note. And Trent and I were talking just after we, we spoke uh, really genuinely um, shocked by the progress and thrilled, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not looking at a um, a ten year situation at the moment. The thing is, um, most of the fuel management burning as it currently stands, or planned burning we talk about, happens on public land. But we're also working with the CFA and Parks Victoria and other agencies and CMAs, and they're really on board as well. So it, it, we very much hope, and it's very much Trent's and other Aboriginal traditional owner groups in Victoria to to be uh, tenure blind because, you know, the fence lines either. So. No, that's right. Yeah, so um, we've got about 